talk was really about the, the ecology of the corn crake, the whole life story of the corn crake, um, how it lives, where it lives, different parts of the year as it goes through there, bringing together all the information about the, the life history of this bird and the bird in its environment, in its natural environment, um, to try and, try and bring some general more awareness to the public on that. For whatever reason, some of us have thought of it as a peculiarly Scottish bird, but or, or even a Hebridean bird, but that's only part of the story. Yeah, in terms of the UK, very much so, is, is the Hebrides is, you know, some of the inner uh, and most of the outer Hebrides are the really stronghold of the concrete population. But the corn crake um, at one time was much more prevalent all across Europe and it still is very common in further east um, in, in Poland, into Czech and Slovak and Bulgaria, into Soviet Russia. Um, lit literally, you know, with the collapse of the Cold War, they discovered millions of pairs of corn crakes that were unknown. Um, partly because there weren't many bird watchers in those parts of, the, of, uh, of Russia and the, the huge expanse of the, of, of the Russian Federation. Um, but these, are, these were birds that were unknown to Western science and it was only with the, the ending of the Cold War and people began to talk to each other and, sh and scientists sharing information that they realised just that, that, that it, was, it was less endangered globally um, than we were inclined to believe because of the, the strength of endangerment that was in, in, in the UK. So what's the, current, what's the current situation as far as its survival is concerned? Well, it's it's moved it's moved off the imminent um, imminent extinction list. Um, it's still a threatened bird because it's still strongly dependent upon the habitat, grassland habitat. Um, it's it, it's dependent upon hiding in the tall grass. So any uh, any harvesting mowing activities um, have to be done very carefully and very timed very carefully till after birds are able to escape. Um, if, if they're just fledglings, then a mower going through the, through the speed that we go through in the, in the grassland doesn't give them a chance to escape. And, and, and that was a, a main cause of, of the, the decline in the bird. They were getting massacred in the fields because they couldn't escape. Um, but with careful, I mean, we know much more about the management style required for corn crake now. Um, and if we can roll it out in a wider countryside management and a, and a wider awareness uh, of, of these issues, then there's a good chance that we can actually recover uh, the, the population. Maybe not to the, the numbers that, that was previously at the, in between the world wars, for example, but certainly much more, uh, much more widely spread and less tenuous than it is just now. I think we heard that um, the ones that we know and love or perhaps despise because of the noise that they make in the early hours uh, spend, of course, some of their times in the bottom end in the southeast of Africa. Yep, they, they spend, they, they have two summers. They have summer here breeding, and then they fly <coughs> down to the southeastern corner in South Africa, Mozambique, and the areas there, um, and spend a non-breeding period there, in, in grasslands there. Um, much quieter, they don't, they don't tend to call, and they tend to be much more single, um, unpaired, obviously, because they're not breeding. Um, and then they'll come back up here for the, for the next, next breeding season. And for many years, this was a complete puzzle because people just didn't believe that birds with these short stubby wings and porky little bellies could actually go all that distance. Um, um, and if you look at some of the very early stories of, of that, where birds went and hibernating, people, people assumed that they, they were hiding in caves or hiding in walls and that sort of stuff there and they come out again because it was just so unlikely they would travel all that distance. But they have been recorded now quite, quite regularly in, in waves moving down through, through Turkey, through, through Egypt, East Africa, or down the coast, right down to the, to the southern part, spending their summer down there. And then when the weather changes to there to become more, more inclement, they'll come back here and it's time for them to start breeding, breeding again here. So there's a, there's, a, there's a logic to the cycle in it. And you've devoted quite a lot of time to pulling something together that's unique, I think. Yep, it is. The, the, thing is the, the thing I'm really pleased about is that this, this book pulls together um, in one place much of the information that's available in concrete, which previously was, was scattered among hundreds upon hundreds of articles, journals, books, you know, snippets, information, scientific reports, and so on and so forth. 
sort of combed all them and, and, and distilled that and brought it all together, um, tried to sort of um, synthesize that so that it gives you the, the, the narrative, it gives you the story, but in the back, all the references of where the information came from are there. So if something particularly jumps out at you in terms of its voice or in terms of its migration or in terms of its, its, its management requirements and whatnot, you can actually follow the references in the back and go to the original resources, many of which are now online and digitised online there. So you can you can actually read the raw material yourself if you if you're interested. So it's a good it's a good book I think for um, those who are just interested in concrete but don't want to get into it in, in, in serious professional terms. But it's also a very useful book for um, young researchers or starting researchers or, or people who are particularly interested in in, in um, landscape ecology because it gives you all the references as well it gives you the raw material the primary resources that you can then follow back and do your own you can build on that and you know it, it'll be a matter of time before somebody else comes in and adds another chapter to this book because of the rate that knowledge is, is getting on there but it's it's good for the first time to pull all this together in between two covers it's, it's very pleasing i'm talking about the rate that knowledge is is coming along um it was interesting to learn that it's only in the last couple of decades uh that much of what we know about the corn creek has come about. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, a lot of this, a lot of that information has become, become more scientific methods of investigation. It's a very reclusive, a very quiet bird, so it's, it's difficult. Many people have heard the corn creek, but very, very few, much fewer have actually seen it. Um, and if you're trying to follow that and look at the, the intimate terms of its relationships, its breeding habits and so forth, what, what it's actually eating as opposed to what you think it's eating, where it goes when it's not here, um, even the sound, I mean, the, the, it, it was quite a surprise to me to discover that the, 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 the crack, 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 crack sound that we hear each year is um, when it's analysed in fine detail, each calling bird, each male calling bird is distinct, it's separate, it's got its own voice. The space between the crack, crack and the repetition space is different timing for every single bird. So it's almost like its own voice, its own signature. So you can tell that bird that you can hear there, that food last night, is the same one in that one here. A different one then, because it's got a different spacing and a different timing of the crack, 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 as it goes through. And so that is that is relatively recently, within the last two or three decades, that's been, that's been found there. And that in itself is now helping to actually be able to identify and count more accurately what's on the ground, because as techniques improve, so these things are, are improving all the time. It's just a matter of, of uh, being able to get the information out there and, and make use of it. But as far as the species is concerned, and we heard that it's a, a very particular species on its own, um, it's fair to say we haven't heard the last for a long time of the corn creek. I, I would hope not. I think, it's, I think it's going to be here for quite a while yet, but I think, I think we still can't afford to take a foot off the brake. I think, I think we have to be very careful and not be too complacent on that. I think over since the Second World War, or since the First World War really, as, as it goes through there, in, in between there was a huge change in agriculture after the First World War. Um, and that was really the, 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 the noticing of the catastrophic decline in the bird. And I think people were really quite complacent um, in, in, in looking at why that was happening. Um, and it took a, a long time to pin down the actual causes of the mechanization, the intensification of farming, or in some cases in Soviet Russia, the abandonment of farming, they become, the ground becomes less suitable for, for those birds. And so these complex issues have taken a while to unravel. And I think now that we know them more detail, um, the challenge is now to apply them um, in the wider countryside um, that allows us to produce food, and to produce livestock and so on, but actually do so in a way that's environmentally friendly as opposed to environmentally destructive. And it's, it's entirely possible, but it has to be done deliberately because we can't afford to take chances. Dr. Frank Rennie, thank you very much. Thank you.